Hello guys, welcome back to the channel. And before we start, I'd like to say a massive thank you to everyone who has subscribed lately. We're at 453 at the moment. We've gone past that 450 mark. Let's try and get to 500. Like I said, once we get to 500, I will be doing a giveaway. And then let's try and get to 1,000 by the end of the year. So this is a quick video from Liveth Forevermore. Absolutely amazing YouTube channel. Really well made videos and really in depth videos. And this is the rescue of Marine Lands Corp from Matthew Ford. So this is a very famous incident where the Apache, or where a couple of guys actually used an Apache's, uh, you know, weapon pod wings. They rode in on that to retrieve this man's body. So let's just crack on. Let's get into the video and we'll discuss a few things as we're going along. So yeah, head over to Liveth for more cracking channel. In mid-2002, a year after the start of the US-led invasion of Afghanistan, Operation Herrick commenced, which was to be the operational code name under which all British military operations in Afghanistan were to be conducted. Four years later, in January of 2006, British Defence Secretary John Reid announced that a British task group would be deployed to Helmand Province as part of the expansion of the NATO mission in Afghanistan. The 16th Air Assault Brigade, who arrived in the country in Well, you have to remember year, about uh, Operation Herrick and Helmand Province, Although it doesn't sound like we had much of an area to control, the Helmand province alone is larger than the UK. And bear in mind, we also had Telic as well, so we had Iraq going on at the same time. So the British Air military was spread quite thin, and that's just not manpower, that's uh, you know equipment as well. So like I said, even though it looks like a really small area on that map, it's larger than the UK. The 16th remained in theatre until October 2006, when it was replaced by the 3rd Commander Brigade, which had as its principal infantry units the Royal Marines of 4-2 and 4-5 Commandos, reinforced by the Skimitar Light Tanks of Sea Squadron of Light Dragoons, in addition to supporting artillery, engineering, so, medical... So, just a quick thing I want to point assets. out in this, this sort of picture here. Unfortunately, when we deployed um, in the early days of, sort of Herrick and Telic, the equipment we had wasn't great so for example this here is the the body armor that originally was deployed in these theaters and it is basically a stab vest with a small so that little square there that is basically the ballistic plate so that's the only thing on that body armor there's one on the back one at the front that's the only thing on the body armor that's going to stand up to a, a rifle round i'm not too sure if the vest itself will stand up to a pistol round but again you know when the taliban are shooting 762 short at you or possibly even 30, uh, 303 Lee Enfield rounds this body armor really wasn't doing much to protect uh, the men itself all right it, it protected from fragmentation but there was a massive sort of public outcry back in the UK within sort of the press about the kit and equipment that the British military two was deployed with at the time so they brought in an urgent operational requirement and that's how we ended up with the Osprey body armor here so you can see the size of the plate, literally the plates on that, that original body armour we used as side plates. That's how small they were, they would just go in the side here. Obviously with her Osprey we started getting these bigger, larger plates. Yeah, medical and logistical assets. Two months into its deployment in December of 2006, the 3rd Commander Brigade launched the first of five offensives aimed at maintaining pressure on the Taliban over the winter months, which were to be collectively known as Although, Operation Glacier. Uh, the it doesn't. Planning for the. It, he's not. He it doesn't even look like he's wearing back plates there. So I don't know. I mean, is that the interpreter? It could be. I'm not sure. Um. But if it's not the interpreter, I mean, I was I don't I wasn't in the army when when the original Her Herrick sort of went on, so I mean maybe they didn't have enough plates to to have in the back as well, because as you can see that that strap just sort of squashes that that back pouch completely, and these guys over here are still wearing the enhanced combat body armor, which is basically a stab vest with a small a small uh, ballistic plate. So interesting. Second such offensive, known as Glacier 2, began on the 10th of January 2007, 
with the target being the Taliban held position known as Jogreen 4, which was being used as a staging area from which the Taliban launched attacks against both British and NATO forces. Preceded by an aerial and artillery bombardment, the plan called for 100 Royal Marines of Zulu Company 45 Commando to conduct an assault mission really like with the helmet the in a small canal using Viking armoured vehicles, whilst the Skimitar tanks of the Light Dragoons laid down suppressant fire. Once across the waterways, the Marines were then to disembark from the Vikings, storm into the fort, destroy any Taliban infrastructure in the area, before disengaging and returning to their forward operating base. Unfortunately, 3rd Commander Brigade had insufficient troops available in the theatre to hold the fort if it was taken, and as such, Operation Glacier 2 was restricted to a large scale. Okay, so it was effective as raids are. Um, unfortunately, they don't really complete sort of a long term operation because obviously they'll go in, they'll take out what Taliban infrastructure and what Taliban and uh, fighters are there at the time, but unfortunately. And we saw it a lot with, in Afghanistan as soon as we left or as soon as these guys leave, the Taliban just move straight back in and it kind of goes back to sort of back to normal. Um, so as great as they are, they don't really achieve much. I mean, I guess against a conventional force, raid would be more effective if you were taking out, you know, a, a supply dump or something like that. But the Taliban don't really work like that. You know, you're fighting an insurgency, so raids aren't as effective. Beginning at midnight on the 14th of January 2007, the 105mm artillery guns of the 29th Commando Regiment Royal Artillery fun. opened fire on Jogreen 4. Bloody hell. Then, at 0300 on the 15th, a USB-1 Lancer heavy Jesus. bomber flew overhead and dropped 20 2,000-pound bombs onto the target Fucking area, hell. with one creating a breach I bet that was a show. the wall. The conclusion of the preliminary bombardment was meant to act as the green light for Zulu Company to move off from their start line. But delays meant it would not be until 0630 as daylight wow. began to break. So I wonder what delays caused them. A, you know, I wonder what caused a six hour delay. That's a, a really long time between an artillery bombardment and air bombardment and to actually move off. That's a lot of time. <laughs> Mounting up onto their Vikings, the Royal Marines began their attack, crossing first the River Helmand and later the canal, before disembarking from their vehicles on the open ground to the south of the fort. At the same time, the Skimitar light tanks of Sea Squadron and the Light Dragoons opened up on the Taliban positions, which were enfiladed in the open ground with small arms, machine gun and RPG fire, resulting in five of the British right. troops becoming wounded. Despite this, the Royal Marines pressed on with scattered groups reaching the hole that had been created in the outer wall by the B-1 bomber. From here, elements of Zulu Company stormed into the fort itself, where, over the next 45 minutes, they fought against stiff Taliban resistance and directed Apache helicopters onto the enemy strongpoints until the decision was made to withdraw back across the river. After breaking contact with the enemy and reaching the west bank of the River Helmand, the senior officers conducted a head count to ensure everyone was accounted for, during which it was realised that a Marine oh, well, was so Matthew Ford. Doing a head count once they crossed back over the river, that's that probably didn't go down too well for the command sort of af in the sort of after action review um you know they had effectively left left a man behind unfortunately consequently a desert hawk 3 surveillance drone was put into the sky to try and find consequently a desert hawk 3 surveillance drone was put into the sky to try and find the missing marine and it was not long before a heat signature was spotted sat up against the outer wall of the fort and identified to be the lance corporal on receiving its location, Zulu Company organised a force of four wow, Vikings a and a dozen Royal Marines to go back across the river and recover their colleague, just as a Nimrod MR2, which had been providing overhead surveillance during the raid, reported that large concentrations of Taliban reinforcements were converging on the fort. Subsequently, the Apache helicopters were tasked with providing air cover for the rescue. However, on being briefed on the mission, the air crews realised that they had insufficient fuel to remain over the target for the duration of the recovery and instead warrant officer Mark Rutherford, the pilot of one of the Apaches, put forward an alternative plan this is where it gets crazy. Zulu Company. Sir, I've got a different idea. We will land at your location, give me four men, and I'll strap them to two Apaches. We will go over, land by the fort, strap the casualty to the base of my helicopter. That's and absolutely come back. nuts. All you need it to takes do some is bollocks to volunteers. do that, but you do anything for you guys. 
After assessing his options, the commanding officer accepted this new plan and found four volunteers to carry it out, including Captain Dave Rigg, a Royal Engineer of the 28th Engineer Regiment, Marines Chris Fraser Perry and Gary Robertson, and Warrant Officer Class 1, Colin Hearn. Captain Dave Mad. Rigg later recalled his reaction to the task. It seemed an extraordinary, almost unbelievable plan. For one thing, I had no idea you could put passengers on an Apache. Where were they going to be? Hanging underneath it? Sitting on the side of it? No one knew at this stage how this would happen. I believe they just sat on the wing. Regardless of these concerns, as Warrant Officer Class 1, Colin Hearn, stated, There was no way we were going to leave him or anyone else on that battlefield. <laughs> With the four volunteers briefed on their task, they grabbed their equipment. That's fucking amazing. That absolute fucking grin. And that is proper sort of just military humour in general. He's probably thinking this is fucking buzzing. Look at that absolute grin. I've never seen a man so bloody happy in my life. Legend. Made their way over to the two Apaches, <clears throat> climbed on board and took off for Juggling 4. With an armed escort provided by a further two Apaches and two US A-10 Thunderbolt aircraft. Whilst a US B-1 bomber carried out a second bomb run to suppress any Taliban resistance. That's mad. Out just after 0930, the four Apaches made their approach to the fort. The escort helicopters, one of which was flown by Captain Charlotte Madison, the first female Apache pilot in the British Army, breaking off to provide far support to the rescue mission. Simultaneously, the two rescue Apaches flew into the target area, with the first mistakenly landing inside the fort itself, whilst the second touched down on the correct LZ, enabling Captain Dave Rigg and Marine Chris Fraser Perry to disembark and move off to recover Lance Corporal Matthew Ford. Rushing over to the outer perimeter wall, Captain Rigg located the wounded Lance Corporal and began to drag him back to the helicopter, with Marine Fraser Perry coming to his assistance moments later. As they neared the Apache, the two pilots jumped out and helped strap the Lance Corporal to the aircraft, all the while under constant Taliban small arms fire, until the four re-embarked onto the helicopter and got into the air once again. Meanwhile, Warrant Officer Class 1, Colin Hearn, and Marine Gary Robertson had become disorientated during the landing and, unknowingly, Not began good. heading towards the inner wall of the fort. Realising he had overrun the LZ, the pilot of the Apache leapt out and warned the two Marines that they were heading in the wrong direction, leading to the three moving off to the outer wall from where they got eyes on Team 2, strapping Lance Corporal Ford to the second helicopter. With the mission completed, the three returned to their aircraft and got back into the air linking up with the second helicopter and the two escorts, who over the course of the rescue had not only used their 30mm cannons, but had also expended Kinhal. all their on board missile and rocket ammunition in holding off Taliban counter-attacks. I think what they're doing now, I think the Apaches are landing. Um, I think they're going to try and get the casualty out, or hopefully, I, I pray and hope I, he's still alive. I think it's going to pick him up, get him out of there. And that's it, the you know, no matter what. You know, you can go into these sort of contacts, these these ticks, um, you know, just buzzing. You know, you saw the face of that that marine sat on the side of the helicopter with a massive grin on his face. But deep down, you know, he's just hoping that that person he's going to help is alive. At the end of the day, that's one of your brothers. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, for for us, it wouldn't matter if it was a marine or a Mercian or a cold stream guard you know if you've heard about a casualty in your AO you would do everything you could you know to get that casualty back so it doesn't matter um, even if you're American or British you know if if we had an American go down in our AO and we were the closest ones there we would be there because you know it, it's kind of that bond so I think what's going to happen is one will be one will be picking them up one will be giving cover we've got two Apaches that are giving air support Come on, be alive. If he's alive, then it's top dollar. Okay, patches are off the deck. You can see a big dust cloud forming now. So I should imagine that's them lifting off. There's hope, they've got the young lad. Okay, I can see one patch coming through the cloud, and he's away, and someone's, whoa, oh, hang on a minute, someone's hanging underneath.
Sitting on one of the wings of the 2nd Apache, Captain Dave Rigg recounted the return into Zulu's position. As we flew over the river, all the Zulu company were lined up on the west bank, waiting and hoping. It was a pretty solo moment for everyone. Seconds later, we landed and put Lance Corporal Ford on the ground. We then moved him to an awaiting CH-47 Chinook helicopter, which flew him back to Camp Bastion. And unfortunately, you know, he, he didn't make it, and that's unfortunately one of the realities of, of sort of war. Rest in peace. So guys, thank you for watching, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and also as well don't forget to head over to Live It Forevermore channel, an amazing channel that has really good documentaries like this. So guys, thank you very much and I'll catch you all later.